Today we will discuss a very important topic about the use of pharmacoepidemiology to study beneficial drug effects. This is the outline of this presentation and these are the main points that will be discussed through. Now I switch the camera to focus mainly on the slides and please follow with me. To start first with the drug development process, in order for any drug to be approved for marketing in the United States, it must be first be proven to be safe and effective using adequate and well-controlled investigation. First of all, the drug must, be, uh, must undergo preclinical testing in which it undergoes lab and animal testing in order to gather information on how it is absorbed, distributed, excreted and metabolized and to, the, and to see whether the drug is toxic or not. Next, once the drug is determined to be safe, it goes through three clinical research phases. The first phase, its purpose is to determine the drug's safety and dosage, and it includes about 20 healthy volunteers in that are tested. The second phase is done in order to test the drug effectiveness and side effects, and this phase includes about 200 patients, and it takes about five years to be done. As for the last phase, it's mainly done in order to test for the effectiveness of the drug and its long-term effects. And during this phase, about 1,000 people or more are tested. And its amount of time is about eight years. Next, the FDA will start testing the drug's safety after its marketing, during which it monitors the drug once the product is available to be used by the public. Okay. Next. I will discuss with you the four definitions of various types of beneficial drug effects. We have at least four different types of measurable drug effects of interest to a prescriber. To start with the unanticipated harmful effects. These are mainly the unwanted effects of drugs that could have not been predicted on the basis of the preclinical pharmacologic profile or the results of pre-marketing clinical studies. And these effects are mainly type B adverse effects, which may they are unpredictable and they are independent of the dose. Next, to move with the anticipated harmful effects. These are mainly the unwanted effects of drugs that could have been predicted on the basis of preclinical and pre-marketing studies. And they could be either type A reactions, which means they, they can be predictable and they are dose dependent, or type B reactions. For example, the syncope that sometimes could occur with patients taking their first dose of pradzosin. Although this effect was known to occur at the time of marketing, a major question remained to be answered was how often this event occurred. To move on with the unanticipated beneficial effects, they are mainly the desirable effects of drugs that were not anticipated at the time of drug marketing. And although these effects may be medically useful, they are nevertheless side effects if they are not the purpose for which the drug was given. Okay, next we have the anticipated beneficial effects. These are mainly the desirable effects that are known to be caused by the drug, and they represent the reason for prescribing the drug. Its study has three aspects. First, we have the drug efficacy. Second, we have drug effectiveness. And third, we have the efficiency, which is mainly to see if the desired effect of the drug can be reached at an acceptable cost. Hello again. To move on with the clinical problems to be addressed by pharmacoepidemiologic research. We know that pre-marketing studies, they are mainly done in a perfect settings compared to the real life settings. And thus, in the pre-marketing studies, mainly the patient's compliance during these studies is assured. In addition to that, the patients that are included are similar to each other in terms of age and sex, and they do not have other diseases. In addition to that, they are not taking other drugs. Also, whether the drug achieves the same beneficial effects in the world of daily medical practice, this is an issue to be determined after marketing the drug. And at the time of marketing, there may be little data on the drug's efficacy relative to other medical or surgical alternatives available for the same indication. Finally, we have different factors encountered in the practice of medicine that can modify a drug's ability to achieve its beneficial effects. 
and these include mainly how the drug is being given, the indication of the drug, the patient's viability such as the demographic status of the patient, the nutritional status of the patients, all can play a major role in this part. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the confounding by indication. Basically, confounding by indication is when the indication is the confounder and affects indirectly the outcome of our study. Okay, so confounding by the indication for frequency is usually not a problem if the study is focusing on unexpected drug effects and side effects, but it can be a problem for studies of unexpected drug effects, whether they're beneficial or harm, which may cause some confusion. Now, the confusion that may arise from confounding variables has made researchers question the uh, uh, the validity of uh, non-experimental approaches to study its drug effects. So what is the solution? We have different solutions. The first solution is that some studies don't require comparative research, uh, such as case studies or series studies that are sufficient and do not require elaborate studies needed to prove a point. Yeah, meaning the point is already there very clear. The second solution is that the study should follow a disease or condition that is predictable with no unpredictable uh, pa uh, pathways. And the third solution is that the study should fo also focus on primary prevention such as vaccines, meaning there are no confusion whether uh, something happened before or not. Uh, the fourth uh, solution is that the indication can clearly be measured as simple as present or not present or absent. The last uh, and the newest solution is what is known as the propensity score, which is a clear measure of indication through mathematical prediction of exposures. Now, how to apply these uh, proposed approaches? We're, we're going to see how non-experimental study designs are used to evaluate drug effects. And out of these 100 drugs, we took 93 drugs and made out of them 131 drug indication pairs, which were evaluated for confounding by the indication and how to address it. Uh, then out of these 131 drug indication pairs, 89 underwent observational studies. And usually a few drugs are approved by this method, which is of the observational studies. And out of these 131 or so, we took 42 drugs and uh, they were found to have confounding by the indication and were subject to comparative research. However, ethical issues play, played a role here. Seven out of, of these 42 drugs, um, uh, we found out, uh, in them that confounding by the indication was not an obstacle for non-experimental study designs. However, 35 out of 42 uh, were affected by confounding by the indication in a non-experimental research setting. Uh, now we will explore some examples uh, uh, of non-experimental research into beneficial drug effects. Uh, we took estrogen in prevention of osteoporotic fractures. Uh, in biochemical studies, it was found that menopause has negative outcomes on calcium and phosphorus balance. Uh, and wh when we gave exogenous estrogens, this balance was restored to normal. And also studies on bo bone density showed that exogenous estrogens prevented bone loss. And uh, it was concluded out of uh, these two studies that estrogen decreases the risk of fractures. However, no direct data were available to prove it or to validate this conclusion. And in addition, uh, exogenous estrogen have a serious side effects, which is uh, they increase the risk of endometrial cancer. Uh, so in this case, an RCT would be ideal. However, the fractures are not very common in the society. So the sample size would be very small, and we need to evaluate uh, the outcome over many years. So we will take a long period of time to see the results. So the best way is to do a non-experimental study, either cohort or uh, case uh, control. And um, these studies here did not uh, include the, the issue of confounding by the indication. Um, when, uh, when we did those studies, we noticed that physicians who prescribed estrogens uh, randomly uh, did not affect the studies by confounding by the indication, but those who selectively picked the patient based on hysterectomy or not, or high fractures or not, uh, these created a um, 
created the problem of confounding by the indication. And also, the group in the, study made, uh, the studies made were not comparable. They were different between placebo and control, uh, and control groups uh, and experimental groups. So after a series of non-experimental studies that showed, diff uh, that showed similar results, a massive RCT was made, and it was called Women's Health Initiative. And it confirmed the findings that uh, estrogens are beneficial on the uh, effects or the risk of uh, fractures. Lidocaine for prevention of death from myocardial infarction, or MI. In another study, the efficacy of lidocaine in preventing death from MI was studied using a case control study design. Among patients admitted to a coronary or intensive care unit for acute MI, those who died were compared to an equal number of patients who survived. Overall, lidocaine did not protect against death. Lidocaine was only effective when death attributable to ventricular arrhythmia were analyzed separately. In this study, the investigators obviously were well aware of the risk of confounding my indication. That's why they attempted to control for this confounding by using the epidemiological technique of certification. That is classifying patients according to the risk of dying from MI in order to control for this inequality of risk as a confounding variant. Anticoagulants for prevention of death from MI. Whether anticoagulants can prevent death from MI have been addressed using randomized clinical trials. However, the results have been inconsistent and inconclusive, possibly because of problems of sample size. Therefore, a case control study that addressed this topic was done. However, the investigators found that it is doubtful whether one can measure and quantitate precisely the risk of dying from MI at the time of the acute episode. Thus, more randomized trials are really needed to provide the answer to this question. And of course, in recent years, with the advent of low molecular weight heparin and thrombolytic therapy, many are forthcoming. So for the generic versus brand name drugs, generic drugs can now be marketed after simple demonstration of bioequivalence. For example, equivalent bioavailability in 18 to 24 patients. However, it's not clear whether bioequivalence reflect equivalent efficacy and toxicity. Clinical inequivalence is more likely to be evident as a difference in beneficial effects rather than toxic effects. Large sample size are required to evaluate differences in efficacy among different preparations of the same active ingredients. Using the non-experimental pharmacoepidemiological studies, such as sample size, are easy to be achieved. Thus, they suggested that studies of clinical equivalence can be carried as post-marketing studies. For the cost-effectiveness studies, here we have two main variables, the clinical variables and the economic variables. We can perform a cohort study and compare treated patients to untreated patients and determine whether the cost of the treatment plan was beneficial in terms of reducing a clinical outcome. Compounding by indication might be also a limitation in this case. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the use of non-experimental study designs for the study of efficacy and safety of vaccines, cancer screening, and the future. So non-experimental study designs were used widely in the past several years to evaluate the efficacy of vaccines. So this type of study raises a methodological consideration of confounding by indication. Ideally, RCTs should be used, not non-experimental study designs. But why not? RCTs, because the relative infrequency of the diseases that the vaccines are designed to prevent, and particularly in population which are partly vaccinated, makes the use of RCTs difficult, although not impossible. In considering the applicability of the non-experimental study design to study the vaccines, for most vaccines, an individual physician will not give the vaccine for only people who are eligible, and patients receiving the vaccines are not likely to differ from those who, don't, who do not get the vaccine, at least in their physician perception, about the patient's risk of contracting these diseases if they were not vaccinated. Therefore, non-experimental study design should produce valid results, and this is evident from their use as a standard approach for studying a lot of vaccines. Another more recent use of non-experimental study designs is to evaluate the efficacy of cancer screening programs. All of these studies as well raise a methodological consideration of confounding by indication and how to define cases, controls, and the time period to choose for the study. Ideally, as well here, the RCT should be used to address questions related to the value of screening, but why not RCTs? Because the diseases are relatively uncommon, only a small 
participant group will benefit from the broad screening program. Thus, they are expensive and require years to be completed. More importantly, recruiting patients into RCTs can be impractical as well as unethical. For the future, many investigate Investigators are now applying the non-experimental design to study beneficial drug effects. However, a careful attention should be paid to the possibility of confounding by indication. Once this limitation is addressed, clinical observation and non-experimental research can be used. Now, the results of these studies are unlikely to be powerful or as convincing as experimental research. Thus, it is suggested not to use them as a replacement for the experimental studies. To quote, any belief that the controlled trial is the only way to study therapeutic efficacy would mean not only that the pendulum had swung too far, but it had come right off the hook, which means, according to the Sir Austin Bradford Hill, a proper balance in attitude about the value of experimental and non-experimental studies probably lies somewhere between the two extremes. So when an experimental study is deemed to be un unnecessary, unethical, infeasible, or too costly relative to the expected benefit, there is frequently a good alternative, which is the non-experimental study distance.